Liz Taylor produces Cicely Tyson in The Corn is Green. While Andy Gibb gets his act together. I'm more aware than I've ever been in my life of what I've got, and I don't want to lose it again. And movie muscle men, are they terrific or just typecast? They are not going to cast Dustin Hoffman for Conan. All this plus Rita Coolidge said yes to James Bond. Mancini conducts the pops, and cool jazz plays Newport. As Entertainment Tonight pleases the crowd for Tuesday, August 23rd, 1. Singer Andy Gibbs started on the comeback trail last night in Atlantic City, his first appearance since being fired from the Broadway musical Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. He's faced other problems, too, as Robin Leach reports. I feel I have to prove myself again a little bit. I've had a few bad years behind me. Love is higher than a mountain. Love is thicker than water. His drug problem and his much publicized romance with Dallas star Victoria Principal are both behind him now. And Andy Gibbs' debut performance as a headlining nightclub act at Atlantic City Resorts International was the first step towards getting his career back on the right track. Just to get out in front of an audience again is a wonderful thing. You know, there was a time where I was pretty reclusive and I sat at home and, you know, I, I started getting moments of itchiness, you know, getting stir crazy. I've got to get out working again, and here I am. Why did your breakup with Victoria affect you so much? Oh, I don't know. When you say it's all over a woman, it's, it's, it sounds pretty weak, but it's kind of true. I think I'm, well, I know I'm a very different person. I'm much mellower, much calmer about things. I just am more aware than I've ever been in my life of what I've got, and I don't want to lose it again. Tomorrow, Andy talks about how difficult it was getting over his romance. There was even a time when I couldn't even look at a street sign that would say Victoria Street. I couldn't even look at it because it was just boom, straight there for me. Cicely Tyson, actress on television and in the movies, took her talents to Broadway last night. She's starring in a revival of The Corn is Green, co-produced by Elizabeth Taylor. Barbara Howard reports. In the acting profession, it's a sign of strength and dignity to refuse to be stereotyped. Katherine Hepburn and Betty Davis were renowned for it in Hollywood. And now Cicely Tyson is doing it on Broadway. She's playing Miss Moffat in Emlyn Williams' The Corn is Green, a role made famous by Davis and Hepburn, and one traditionally reserved for a white actress. It was left me by my uncle, Dr. Moffat. I'm Miss Moffat. I'm taking your Miss Robbery. When she was first approached to play the character of the English spinster, she was asked to appear in a new adaptation with an all-black cast. Tyson disapproved and said she would star in the role only as it was originally written. What made you stick to your gun, Cicely? Because I went by my gut instincts. And they would have governed me this far. So, I mean, I, it would be foolish for me to change. How does it feel to be the proud producer? Very proud. I think it's a wonderful production, and I think Cecily and everyone in it uh, just did a superb job. Was there ever any doubt in your mind that Cicely could pull this off? I think Cicely is one of the most talented ladies in our entertainment uh, world. She can do anything. She can do anything she sets her mind to. Is it something of a relief for you to be at an opening night party and not be the guest of honor? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's really nice. <laughs> Tyson's reviews were not good, and if some in the audience weren't exactly applauding her performance, they had to be applauding her commitment. Barbara Hauer, Entertainment Tonight.
Now some stories from our entertainment wire. Johnny Carson says he will file suit against two fellow investors in a failed Los Angeles bank, charging they smeared his name and reputation. Carson originally was a defendant in a $70 million suit connected with the bank investment, but charges against him have been dismissed. Actor Todd Bridges of the television series Different Strokes has been arraigned on charges of carrying a concealed weapon. Bridges was stopped for speeding in Beverly Hills last month, and officers found a 45 caliber pistol in his car. Bridges said he needed the weapon because he had been shot at and harassed by men he said claimed to be members of the Ku Klux Klan. And according to Eddie Murphy, People magazine had it all wrong in its story about his performance in Detroit. The magazine said Murphy engaged in a shouting match with his audience, which didn't like his smutty routine. People said the crowd kept calling for Murphy's Saturday Night Live routine, and he walked off the stage. Murphy's version goes like this. A guy threw his hat to me, right? Yeah. And I put the guy's hat on, and then the guy said, here's my shoe, and he threw a shoe to me, but the paper said the guy threw a shoe at me, but psh. The the audience loved it. The Boston Pops Orchestra is taking it on the road, and the Universal Amphitheater in Los Angeles was the first stop. Since 1885, the Boston Pops have been delighting audiences with their unique blend of classical and popular music. They've just begun the first leg of a 12-city tour with guest conductor Henry Mancini, mainly conducting the music of composer Henry Mancini. When I'm doing a score, I'm sitting down for a long time, and doing, you know, just writing and writing until I get it finished. But this you get out, it's the difference between uh, getting off your backside and standing on your feet for a change. What happens inside, it's like, uh, you know, when you get all those strings here, we've got, we have 80 people, you know, out on the stage, and when they all start to play and all those strings, it's like taking a warm bath, you know, it's lovely. For the third straight week, the top spot on our movie charts goes to Risky Business. The teenage sex comedy took in another $5.2 million over the weekend for an Entertainment Tonight movie index of nearly $5,900 per screen. Mr. Mom remained in second place, but it was close. Mr. Mom had a per screen average a shade over $5,800, and that's $64 per screen behind Risky Business. Rodney Dangerfield's Easy Money jumped into third spot its first weekend out with an ET index of almost $5,200. Fourth spot on our chart, National Lampoon's Vacation, which remains strong with an ET index of just over $3,200. Cujo, last week number three, this week dropped to fifth place with ticket sales down substantially from last weekend. Next, pecs and biceps. Beefcake shoots for big box office. At Rita Coolidge, she's got the latest James Bond theme song. Our spotlight today shines on the world of people, especially those who like flexing and posing. Biceps and pecs are proving to be one of the biggest draws at the movie box office since Beach Blanket Bingo. Dale Haramoto has the story. Movies certainly pack a lot more muscle these days. And most of it's on the rippling biceps of leading men like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Lou Ferrigno. Beefcake has always had a place in the movies. But now, the bigger the beef, the better. Muscles are definitely in. Macho City! Macho City! Macho City! While movie stars have always bared their chests for the camera, it was bodybuilder and former Mr. Universe Steve Reeves who really started the muscle man to actor trend with a film called Hercules. I go to studios, they said, yes, we would sign you for a contract like we did Tony Curtis or Rock Hudson, but the trouble is you have all those muscles and uh, what can we do? There's only one picture, we'll say every five years, where we'll need you in. So uh, we can't do it. It wouldn't be economically sound for us. But then Hercules came along, and uh, that was it. Hercules was a box office smash, 
and Reeves went on to star in 13 more films. But in the process, he got typecast as the good-looking muscle man who couldn't act. Do you think that actors today suffer from the same kind of prejudices, actors who are very physical? Oh, no, not at all. Now, this, this is a day of fitness. I mean, actually, they have an advantage. I mean, a lot of actors who wouldn't have thought of uh, exercising before exercise now so they can take their shirt off in and, and scenes. It's one thing for a trained actor like John Travolta to get in shape for a part, but it's quite another for a bodybuilder to get in shape as an actor. Well, first of all, I was trained as an actor, uh, just like everybody else is, uh, has been trained as an actor, you know. The only thing is that uh, people sometimes still remember me more for bodybuilding because what I have achieved in bodybuilding is much more than I've achieved so far in acting. You know, because 14 world championship titles in, in bodybuilding, I would have to win now 14 Oscars to kind of come equal to that kind of achievement. It's unlikely Arnold Schwarzenegger will win many Oscars playing Conan. Since he's starring in the sequel, Conan, King of Thieves, and there are more sequels to come, there's no doubt he too will be typecast. I, I don't believe in typecasting, you know, because I think that the industry is based on, they find always their characters, you know, if they look for, if they look for John Wayne character, they look for John Wayne, you know, and if they, they look for uh, a Conan character, they look for, for me, you know, this is, you, it, it, you, they are not going to cast Dustin Hoffman for Conan. Dustin Hoffman probably wouldn't be cast as Hercules either. Although former Mr. America Lou Ferrigno will be playing a paramedic on TV next season, he's had to struggle against the muscle man image. I did at the beginning of my career, but I've changed it all. Because now, as a respectable actor, people don't treat me that way. But at the beginning, I demanded that respect for myself. Casting directors will, you know, most of the time, they'll see you in, in one line. But you got to start someplace. So I'd rather I'd rather be playing something that I can do, and physically I can I can do these roles very easily. Reb Brown is the newcomer who shows off his body in the just released Your, and Reb is another muscle man turned actor who's not embarrassed about the roles he plays. I enjoy playing these type of roles, and as far as a few years down the line, if I can still do them, fine, because they're fun for me. You know, love scenes and things like that are wonderful and stuff like. But when it gets right down to it, I like to fight. <laughs> <laughs> the appeal of the new muscle movies is so strong that the latest entry in the field features a plot that could have come from a comic book. Leonard Maltin has a review. There's a curious kind of charm to a film that flaunts its idiocy as completely as you're the hunter from the future. And as I started watching it, I was transported back to the Saturday matinees of my youth. This feeling lasted about... 15 minutes, but the film went on for another hour and a quarter. Your is a ridiculous caveman type movie that gives new meaning to the word tacky. Just wait till you see the special effects and hear the theme music. And there's great dialogue, like the gods must be appeased with fresh blood, or when you have inseminated this woman, you will die. Here's one of the better scenes in the movie. <laughs> Although the star is American Reb Brown, Yor is actually an Italian movie filmed mostly in Turkey. The dubbing and sound effects are the kind that always draw a few laughs on The Late Show. But as I say, such pleasures are fleeting in a feature-length film as bad as this. Yor is one of those pictures the studio wouldn't screen for critics, so I saw this with a paying audience the other day. When it was over, I asked the opinions of two young moviegoers sitting in front of me. I'd say they were about 11 years old. One of them said, it was boring. And the other one declared, it's the dumbest movie I've ever seen in my whole life. So don't just take my word for it. Trust the cash customers too. Your is a dog. And on our scale of one to 10, it rates a one. I'm Leonard Malton, Entertainment Tonight. Ouch. Singing the James Bond theme song has led to a pop chart hit for some performers, but that sort of success has proved elusive for the latest Bond singer. Rita Coolidge is the latest performer to sing the theme song for a James Bond movie. She had high hopes for All Time High. It seems that every time somebody does a Bond theme song, it becomes a hit. 
it does seem that way, doesn't it? That's why when, when I got the phone call, I mean, the, you know, the question, do you want to do the, new, the theme song for the new Bond film was the quickest question and answer in my life. Is, <laughs> let me think yes. Although the song is number one on the adult contemporary charts, it's had a poor showing on the pop charts. Nor has Rita's latest album, Never Let You Go, been drawing the following she'd hoped for. Her last major hit... Chris, you know, of, of both of our lives and our careers falling apart because we got divorced, and I don't think it has that either have anything to do with each other. I think it just all kind of happened at the same time. Neither of us were had any idea the, the scale of success that a film like A Star Is Born can bring into into a life, you know, or, or platinum albums. When you start talking on that magnitude, you don't you don't think about that when you're getting married. You just don't. Can you ever see seeing a duet with Chris again? I don't. I, I have. I mean, I I wouldn't. I have no reason not to. I, but I can't see any reason to either. I and mean, I think it would really be a, just sort of another cheap media trick for Chris and I to do a record together. We never had a great time, you know. Uh, it, it was just never that the marriage didn't extend into doing duet albums or I mean, it was never, you know, a, a especially wonderful experience. It's something that we did because we were married and because we worked together and because we could sell records and, you know, possibly can extend that concert tour a little bit further. Even during the bad times, Rita has maintained an optimistic outlook. It's something she acquired from her father, a Southern Baptist minister. He taught me when I was a kid that that if, if you lived in a, in a land of flat lands and no mountains, then you would never learn to climb and you'd never learn to fall down. And, uh, I mean, I wouldn't want to be happy all the time. You know, then it wouldn't mean anything. I wouldn't want to have hit records all the time, because then it wouldn't, I wouldn't know what it's like to be on the other side. close-up section today we'll take you to two outdoor music festivals one on the Atlantic in America the other along the Rhine in West Germany with the Steve Miller band the setting was like a picture postcard as 18,000 West German rock fans gathered for an eight-hour concert at the Lorelei Amphitheater along the Rhine Steve Miller was the headliner on the show which was being broadcast as a special episode of the weekly German program Rock Palace the broadcast goes to 14 European countries, including one in which rock music is seldom seen. For the first time this is going into Russia, the Russians are taking the transmission to the sat from the satellite, so... How do you it's, feel about that? Well, I think that's real good. I'm, I'm glad to have an opportunity to put to play my music in an uncensored atmosphere and, and hopefully have it played in Russia on TV. I like that idea. The rich and famous at the Rhode Island Resort of Newport not only have the America's Cup conducted in their backyard this year, they have the smooth sounds of the cool jazz festival too. Ella Fitzgerald said it all in one word as the cool jazz festival came to Newport, Rhode Island over the weekend. They still call it the Newport Jazz Festival here because that's what they called it when it started. And this year, it's the 30th anniversary. Chuck Mangione was on the program along with seasoned veterans including Dizzy Gillespie. Here we see them backstage comparing notes, so to speak. The Newport Jazz Festival is something special for everybody who comes. It was the first, it was the original, you know, I've never really been here before, so it's a treat for me to be here. Dizzy Gillespie played the first Newport Jazz Festival in 1954. He says jazz is more popular today than it was a few years ago because the music touches more people now. For him, the jazz life has been a good one. Well, there's no other profession where you have a permanent vacation that's what it is, a permanent vacation. Ella
Ella Fitzgerald, who has made bebop into a fine art, comes to this year's festival at a new peak of popularity. While many adults know her for her records, kids know her as the Memorex lady who also sells Kentucky Fried Chicken. I love what I'm doing because I love people and I love children. And uh, this is my inspiration. That's what keeps me going. show Michael Landon. He's making a TV movie about his childhood. And behind the scenes on Footloose, the kids fight a ban on rock and roll. We'll be back tomorrow with the latest news and up-to-date television ratings, plus an interview with Staying Alive Cynthia Rhodes. Also on tap, a report on some canceled network shows that'll be coming back anyway with brand new episodes. Here's another look at Ella Fitzgerald working her magic at the Cool Jazz Festival. Enjoy it. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.